This is API Case Files. Hear this message. To this channel. Like E.T. said. This is API Case Files, the official podcast of Aerial Phenomena Investigations. It's February 2014, and this is Episode 2. Thanks for joining us. I'm Marsha Barnhart, Chief of Investigations for API, and your host for today's episode. I'm happy to report that Episode 1 of API Case Files was a popular success. So far, there have been well over 1,400 downloads. If you're a new listener, you may want to go back and listen to Episode 1 as well, because in it, we provide a summary of who we are, what we're all about, and what we're hoping to achieve with this podcast. One thing we're interested in is interaction with our listeners. If you have a question for API or Antonio Paris, a comment, a criticism, we'd like to hear from you. And we'd even put it on the air and put you on the air if you'd like to ask your question or explain your views. The best email address for listener feedback is podcast at aerial-phenomenon.org. We also encourage you to join our listener community on Google+, where you can comment, ask questions, or interact with your fellow listeners. All the hyperlinks we mention on this show will also be provided in the show notes. If you are a witness to a recent UFO sighting, then by all means, please go to our website at aerialphenomenon.org and click on Report a UFO. If you are willing to speak to us and would like us to investigate your report, please make sure you enter yes to the question, Do you want us to contact you for an investigation? As explained on the UFO report form page, our team of trained field investigators will fully investigate the reports that best promise to provide us with solid, corroborated evidence. Witness anonymity is assured. We will never release personally identifying information about a witness. Now, on to this episode of API Case Files. API Deputy Director Paul Carr and I are going to be joined by API Field Investigator Ray Nuvalone for a discussion on the difficult problems encountered in handling reports of alleged alien abduction and missing time. Director Antonio Paris also weighs in with API's policies in handling abduction cases. We will then present part two of our two-part interview with David Marler, author of Triangular UFOs, An Estimate of the Situation. In his Investigator's Notebook, API Director Antonio Paris will discuss the topic of Report of Investigations, or ROI. And in Unidentified Science, Paul will discuss the difficult problems with extraterrestrials as an explanation for UFO sightings. Cherish will be here with listener questions and comments, and we'll have our customary 20-second recommendations from our team. Also, Antonio is going to give us an update on the latest plans for API Con 2014 coming up this May in Florida. Now we'd like to give a hearty welcome to our own API field investigator, Ray Nuvalone. Ray, he's our go-to guy for high strangeness, abduction, recovered memory type cases. So we wanted to have a little discussion with Ray about how he thinks those cases should be handled, and we'll talk. We'll have a bit of a roundtable on that, and we we'll talk about some specifics that we've dealt with. Now, Ray, it might be advantageous if you'd give our listeners a little bit of your background. Uh, well, I'm just a, psycho- I'm a psychology student right now. I've been researching this topic independently for almost ten years now. I start off with just UFOs, but abductions, and I also like demonic possession. They're very close related, in my opinion. So I've researched both of those independently, you know, and then I joined the UFO team and been doing cases ever since. So, Ray, when somebody reports a purported alien abduction case to API, what's your first reaction and how do you, how do you think we should handle it? Uh, I think the first thing I always do is uh, do a, you know, find out the witness, do a background check, other checks of similar reports around the area that could match the time frame so you have more than one possible witness 
And then after that, you'd want to get in touch with the, the witness and do an introductory interview and see if the case warrants the further investigation. And let's say that the person, you discuss, you contact the person, how do you decide whether or not to take that investigation further? For all, for instance, the recent case we had, we show up to interview the individual and he's, you know, he's drunk. So that's a pretty good disqualifier, in my opinion. Okay, so give me an example of, of someone that you, you, know, you you contact them and and you would think they might we might want to go further with the case. Oh, well, like I guess the case from uh, Philly, where the gentleman said he had a implant. Uh, that's some physical evidence. That's something we want to find. That's what we're looking for. So it would be a case that uh, we would definitely want to bring further into investigation, which we did, and it was a good case, and we closed it up. And typically, what what sort of thing does an abductee purported abductee report when they when they issue a reduction report? Missing time, feelings of sensations around them they can't see. It, it varies. I mean, there's so many. There's not really there, but they all basically fall into the same realm. That's why you know dealing with these cases are very individual. So as much as you want to lump them all together, you can't because each case is going to present something different to an investigator. Now, Ray, can you give us a little background on that case you were talking about and you closed it out? What did you close it out with, and what was the synopsis on that case? Well, the witness basically reported he had, uh, you know, what he believed was an alien implant. So he had it tested by a doctor that offered to test it for him, x-ray it, and found that it was there, and he believed he said there was no signs of entry, and it was very strange how it got in there. But the problem I've had with the case is when I investigated it, uh, the doctor that did this reporting for him really wasn't an expert in that part of the body. I believe uh, he was a podiatrist, and the uh, the implant was in a totally different part of the body. The red flag, and I brought it to a podiatrist, and they told me the same thing. That told you the same thing. Yeah, you know that that could be almost anything, and it's not as no abnormal as that. So it wasn't extracted? He said that he doesn't think that, no. And that was the thing with the witness, too. He said he refused to ever have it investigated again. I asked him if he would ever have it looked at again. He, he was not interested in that. And he's not interested in having it removed at all. What case number was that? Oh, um, That was a year ago. I don't recall uh -huh. the case number. When you do a background check on somebody like that, how extensive can you be if you aren't, you know, if you don't have a private investigator's license? Well, on this individual, it was kind of easy. He's been very open about his experiences. I, he, I believe he even spotted at a MUFON conference a couple of years prior to my investigation. So it wasn't that difficult with the witness. Um, you know, other witnesses, I agree with you, it is a little difficult. Now, we've all read extensively about, you know, manufactured memories and that type of thing. I, I was listening just last night to this Kathleen Loftus, who's a specialist in memories that aren't really memories. And we all know that even though somebody is very detailed and very emotional about a memory, it doesn't make it real. How do we sort through what people honestly believe took place that never took place and those that honestly believe something took place that may have taken place? How do we sort through and, and get through uh, to the truth, whatever that may be, Ray? Ray? It depends what you want to believe. I mean, it's psychology. There, It's basically investigators. Most investigators like you and I believe that repressed memories can be re retrieved, but clinicians don't believe that at all. They believe that when you try to do this, there's a very good chance you can implant false memories. And uh, actually, that's been done recently and uh, with mice. I believe that was in the news mm -hmm. this week. So science is trying to find an answer to this. Uh, it's not something that's totally not researched. It is. Uh, repressed memories are used in some, from what I understand, in a couple of states in the country in a court of law. You know, so it is taken seriously, I think, yeah. in, in science and in, uh, in general. If, if we all know, and I think even the audience will admit, that many memories are whole cloth manufactured, and we aren't sure how the mind and the brain works to just make things up. But also, there there is, just like a faction of UFO reports, perhaps 95, 96% are explainable. There is a small little group that is inexplicable, regardless of how much we can nose into the facts. And there is also a small faction of human beings who this may have actually happened to. They may have actually 
interacted with some type of non-known being, interdimensional or from outer space or whatever, and this thing did happen to them, and now they are trying to sort through exactly what did happen to them. What kind of resources do you know of that will help this faction of perhaps real uh, abductee? Uh, by resource, you mean like how would I help them deal with that? Yeah, how how do they deal? How do they find the truth of what happened to them? Because if they go to somebody and does and have a memory regression done, you have just then tainted the pool. Right, right. It's, it's tough because if they really do, I think they do need to speak to somebody. I mean, you can't just hold it in. You need to speak to somebody. Uh, who do you speak to? That's the thing. Um, do you want to speak to an investigator? Do you want to talk to a friend and family? But as an investigator investing, investigating something like that, you want to speak to their friends and family. You want to speak to as many people as you can to build up a personality profile on this person. Mm -hmm. And to see, and it gives you an idea. Um, you know, friends and family will be very honest with you. They know this person better than anybody else. And uh, they will be very honest with you if they think there's something strange. For instance, one case we had in Wisconsin, uh, you know, I didn't know this individual at all, but I spoke to his wife. I spoke to his friend, and, uh, you know, they informed me that sometimes they believe he injures himself, and that is exactly what happened during the investigation. He, he called me and said that the aliens came and cut him up, but really, you know, he most likely did that to himself, and we had to protect that witness in that mm -hmm. case. Mm -hmm. uh, see, see, yeah, that my, my point is, and my concern is that if somebody genuinely thinks they've had an interaction with some type of non-homo sapien being, and they have, um, regressive memory done, then from that point on, it's kind of suspect anything that comes out because somebody just went in their mind, a human just went in their mind and opened little places up and, and you don't know how they directed the questions to open that up that thereby planted memories or made this person want to try to please the questioner. So then now you've got this conundrum, what you thought was a good case, and now he's gone in, somebody's opened up his mind, and now now it's tainted. I agree with you, and that's why I would never use that tactic when um, mm -hmm. dealing with an abductee. I think a long-range set of questions and interviews will get you a lot more truth and consistency of a story than trying to do a regression. Like you said, you're tainting it, and plus you don't know what you're pulling out or what you're putting in. At yeah, least, now the, at least the when question, in a long-term interview, you do your initial interview, and then you would wait some time, do a different sort of interview, and you would want at least five different interviews with this witness, and then compare those interviews, and want yeah. to make sure that everything is consistent. Prior to investigating the witness, if they had regressive hypnosis, then you're starting right out of the chute with some possible tainting, aren't you? Yes, you are. That's why, again, you know, speaking to as many people and mm -hmm. knowing that individual as well as you can is important because yeah. if you hear something that's inconsistent, you can identify it. Yeah. I, I personally believe that a lot of these people do really believe what happened to them. That doesn't mean that it happened. Mm -hmm. There are people who have near-death experiences that believe what they have seen have, has happened to them, but there's a lot of research in that that shows that this is merely a trick of the brain, uh, more mm -hmm. like the broad lobe of the brain. Uh, that's been tested under lab conditions where uh, a magnetic field has been applied to the, to the temporal lobe of the brain, and paranormal experiences have, been, have happened. Yeah. And two, of course, there's, there's neurobiological, uh, studies that have been done on the amygdala and that if there are certain heavy duty stress or fears attached to incoming information, the amygdala throws it off to an area that doesn't go to long term memory. So you, uh, forget what happened to you just shortly after it happened. And it can also reorder your memory of what happened under stress, duress, or, or fear. So the amygdala being this little organ that, that helps us, um, order memories, even that now, even though we know a lot about it, it's a faulty source of how we can sort through what somebody actually had done to them. I, I agree, Martian. I mean, I, these near-death experiences like we just were, there was a recent famous case about a neurosurgeon 
who said that, you know, what he, happened to him was true. But doctors have discovered since then that the amygdala got damaged, and that's why he lost all, all, con, all sense of time and what he was saying in his book, his story. Because it didn't make sense in the time-wise what he was saying. Yeah. So it, it definitely proves what you just said with the amygdala, yes. Now let's go off in another direction. Now, Paul, you recently had a quote that you did in one of your blogs about Arthur C. Clarke saying essentially and paraphrasing that the universe is stranger than we can imagine. Now, what if there actually are beings that so know Homo sapien that they know how to neurobiologically bypass these areas like the amygdala that lay down memories and they're able to, because they know our physiology, they're able to actually do things without humans remembering it or every once in a while they may screw up and humans do remember it this is another area that it is possible because the universe is stranger than we can imagine it is possible that there is a faction of the population of humans on this planet that are undergoing some transformative type of interaction with beings of another world there may be that well I think it is possible Marcia I just the question is how can we humans figure that out or, or what's going, whatever is going on, if anything. Yeah. Because many, many things are at least logically possible and there's too many for us to field all of them. We have to try to work through one thing at a time. Right. Ray, I have my, one of my major concerns in this whole field is something, and I, and I'm glad you're our go-to guy because it makes me nervous. A lot of the people that come to us are, have had an experience they would describe as traumatic or, upsetting i've seen a witness tremble as he described his experience right the what about what are the ethical concerns here when when somebody comes to us we want to get to the truth we want to know what happened but we also we have a person here who possibly needs help or at least needs to get over some emotional trauma they might be perfectly sane they just they have this these memories that are extremely disturbing how do we handle that well, I think uh, with API, number one, we always want to protect our witnesses, right? Uh, witnesses' protection is, is key in any case, and uh, I take that seriously when doing these cases. Uh, like I said, for instance, in the Wisconsin case, you know, we had a witness most likely injuring himself. Uh, we had to contact the authorities possibly and to protect that witness. Uh, you want to investigate, inve uh, investigate the case as best you can and as professionally as you can, but at the same time, you want to protect that witness. So are there any things that we don't, we don't do to make sure that that witness is not we don't do regression hypnotics. That's what we don't do. We... We're making it sound like this doesn't genuinely actually occur. It could very well be that it is genuinely actually occurring, and we just are not in a mindset that we can believe it. It could be, gentlemen, that there are actually beings who are abducting people it could here be. now. It could be, but what we have really, all we have to deal with is at this point is people's memories. We don't have any solid evidence of any abductions that I'm aware of. Uh, the numbers break down. You get about, on average, 10 to 12 abduction claims per night per state in the United States of America. Unless you believe an alien, uh, that's a lot. That, unless that's like an alien invasion, in my opinion. And those statistics actually fall more in line with statistics of mental health problems. Let's talk about a very common source of these reports, Ray, and that is waking sleep or hypnagogic or hypnopopic experiences. I've right. had one. Of, I've had one of those, and I can tell you that they are absolutely terrifying. Mm -hmm. And uh, you feel like you're under attack, and you can't move. You can't even yell, and it feels very real. Yeah, it's it seems very real. It doesn't seem like a dream at all. It is, in fact, a waking dream. I also know people who've seen ghosts in a waking dream. Uh, we know that this kind of thing happens. This is a very well documented psychological phenomenon. What percentage of the cases that, you know, roughly do you think that we get are, are just explained that way? All right. Yeah. So with waking dreams, I, I just don't think it's a, it's a good explanation for this because when you get more than one witness, I think that explanation goes out the window. I mean, unless you want to talk about two people having the same dream at the same time, which I mean, that's just weird. I can't buy into that. So, I mean, with a single witness, yeah, that explanation works. But when you're working with people who have had the same experience, three or more is what I mean by a group. That goes out the window, that explanation. 
Okay, so we were kind of picking up with the fact that when you have multiple witnesses, somebody is not asleep. That it's it's far weirder to think that people are having a shared sleep experience than they are having perhaps a shared interdimensional experience of another sort, huh? Right. If, like I say, if the explanation is weirder than the, the thing I'm investigating, you know, that's probably not a good explanation. Uh, two people, three people, five people uh, don't really have the same dreams at the same time. Mm-hmm. And their stories are usually very well matched. So uh, it, that really doesn't match. Have, have you investigated a case with multiple witnesses? Myself? No, not yet. Yeah. I mean, I'm so far, if... every abduction case we've had has been a sole witness. I'm wondering how many cases there are like that. I, I, I don't think there's very many, are there? I mean, there's the Pascagoula case. Unfortunately, there's not. I have a case right now that, that is a past case um, that the person is continuing to have interactions, not just him, but his girlfriend. And um, it is a shared experience that they are awake for, and they've never had regressive memories, but they are sharing the same phenomenon. And um, they aren't asleep, and they have memory of it uh, conscious. So I think it is taking place now. It could be that this guy and his girlfriend are loons, but I honestly do not think so. It could very well be a genuine phenomenon that is taking place that uh, we really have to stretch our gray matter to accept as being possible. I think we have to have kind of a nuanced view of of how people can be deluded but not crazy, right? I mean, I think the vast majority of people reporting abductions are not crazy, I, I, I think that that's pretty well established. Uh, even Susan Clancy said that. Like two people could look down at a highway on a hot day and see the mirage of, of a shimmering lake. Both people saw this, and it's the optics and, and how light bounces around here that made them see that. It isn't true, but they both shared that same vision, right? I think the research shows memories are not a tape recorder in our heads. They are constructed. Correct. And they yeah. can be constructed out of social interactions as well as what's going on in our own brains. Yeah. We have to be very careful. I'd be hesitant to call anyone crazy unless they were doing something self-destructive or or uh, you know, having constant delusions about everything. So you're talking about a you're talking about a transitory delusional experience then, a psychotic well, break that can occur with normal humans. I think almost everybody has some delusions about something. Uh-huh. And some false memories and some inaccurate memories. Mm-hmm, Most mm-hmm. of us do not remember our childhoods at all accurately. We, yeah. Uh, if you go back and try to piece together the details, you will realize, oh, I was wrong about that. I didn't remember that correctly. Uh, or yeah. my sister remembered it differently or my my father remembered it differently. And that's very common. It's, that's true. Everyone. It's it's just normal hum, human brain function. People could have be completely wrong about an experience that happened to them and feel very strongly that it happened that way and not be mm-hmm. crazy. But now let's get back to multiple witnesses. If there are multiple witnesses to an abduction, uh, well, first of all, I don't, I'm not aware of any cases like that. I, do you believe there are some? Oh, yeah. There's a, there was a famous case in Africa. A group of school children claimed to, they don't really claim to have been abducted, but they had a UFO sighting and an interaction with beings. And these are all young school children in Africa. And they're all older now. This happened a while ago. And all of them stick to their story. The thing is, is they had no idea what UFOs were. They didn't know what aliens were supposed to look like, but they all drew pictures. You know, you, a lot of people here say, oh, this is all due to, you know, the Hollywood hype and things we see in media. And uh, so how they come up with the story, stick with it 20 years later, that's an interesting case, you know, multiple witness case. Okay. And then there's the Pascagoula case. That's only two witnesses, but they have stuck to their story. Well, one of them's dead now, but the other, the other guy still sticks to his story. Right. And the, the police, the police testimony from that is the most interesting because they thought they were crazy, and they brought them in and secretly vi- uh, recorded them what they were saying. And when they record, listened to those recordings, those gentlemen were genuinely terrified by whatever happened to them. The police knew at that point, all right, these guys aren't making up their story because they're genuinely terrified. You can't fake that kind of fear. Those guys did not see the the stereotypical gray beings. They saw robots, right? Yeah, yeah, did some futuristic stuff, and uh, you know, like I said, I posted at one time. You thought it was interesting. You know, most people think of gray aliens when they think of cases, but really, they count for less than fifty percent of the cases. 
uh, you know, people get abducted by all kinds of beings, aliens, demons, uh, good aliens, reptilian aliens, gray aliens, I mean, you name it. So, you know, it's all up to the individual. That's why I said before, each case needs to be really investigated for an individual basis. You got some things to go off of by other cases, but you can't bunch everything into one. What about another famous multiple case in 1969? Um, I believe it's Lauren, I forget her last name, her whole family was abducted by aliens. A family of seven people. Yeah, now now Paul could say... I, uh, Bud Hopkins investigated that. But Paul could say they were all intimately aware of one another and they could have had some kind of shared well, psychosis. Well, was, was this a recovered memory of an abduction or consciously uh, she, recalled? She had some recovered memories, but other people who in the family did not. And they match what they're saying with her recovered memories. Like I said, each case is interesting. Each case, you know, you could say, aha, it doesn't hold true to another case. Okay, what would we like to say to people out there listening who feel they've had one of these very strange experiences? What do we want to say to them, and, and, and should we encourage them to report it to us or to, to, to whom? Yes, report it. Report it. Uh, definitely, it's not stigma. It, there's no stigma against it like there used to be. People are more accepting of this, and and you will be treated fairly with our team, at least. Um, I don't know how other teams treat this topic because I've haven't I've only worked on this team, but I know we treat you professionally and uh, with respect. Like I said, always with a case, we make sure that the individual is our top priority in his well-being. Yeah, and, and we don't we don't disclose their identity without their permission. No, not at all. No, no, and that's the thing. You need to speak to somebody about this because if you don't, I mean, there there's evidence that it will slowly start to eat away at you. Uh, you need to get it out and speak with somebody. And that, there's nothing wrong with talking to anybody. And a lot of people don't feel they can talk to a friend or family. They feel embarrassed. They don't want them to think that they're crazy. So speaking to a stranger may be your best option. And uh, well, we're not going to recommend hypnotic regression if they come to us. No. Uh, uh, we we may recommend that they contact a therapist, though, right, in some cases. If that if I, If we feel it's a serious enough thing that they are experiencing that's going to be ongoing and that we can't resolve, yes, of course, that's that's going to be our suggestion. All right. Well, Ray, any further thoughts? If somebody contacts us with an abduction case, what should they, anything else that you'd want them to know or to understand before they do that? Your story will be taken seriously. It will be investigated properly. It will be kept, kept confidential. And as we said before, it is good to speak to somebody about these experiences. So if you believe this has happened to you, and you've not spoken or don't feel like you could speak to somebody, we'd be happy to listen to your story. Thanks, Ray. Paul also caught up with Antonio a little later to get his take on how API handles abduction reports. We've been investigating UFOs for, well, we're going on our third year now, and on occasion we've looked at some abduction cases, or should I say alleged abduction cases, my personal take is that, just like Ray mentioned, is that really all you have is witness account. We really haven't seen, at least in our part, any physical proof that any abductions have actually taken place. Now, I'm no licensed doctor or physician, so that's why I kind of tend to stay away from abduction cases. You have a few witnesses I have personally talked to. Just speaking with them after a few after a few minutes, there's obviously something wrong with them, and they need they need some technical health assistance. For what for our end, the most that we can do is take as much information as possible, just like we do during any investigation, go through the, uh, the witness interview process, and maybe there's a couple things we can do after that. Network with local people that actually do those kind of stuff. Up in Maryland, Dr. Resta, on occasion I've passed a case up to him and he'd sit down with the witness. There are a couple of groups out there that specifically deal with alleged abductions, including MUFON. So, you know, it's good to pass those cases on to them. But for aerial phenomena, we're about the nuts and bolts of the phenomena. And I don't think that abduction cases fall into that category. I think I think from an ethical perspective, and this is how I look at an abduction claim, somebody reports that they were abducted. That's the word they use, abducted, allegedly, forced out of their home 
in some cases they were raped or or had some medical experiments done on them without permission so the allegations themselves are no different than a kidnapping a rape put those together and it's a crime now whether or not these things actually happen if somebody's reporting those type of allegations we we are not in the business of investigating those cases we are not trained medical professionals we are not law enforcement and that's why Ray who's our specialist I always tell him when you're interviewing these people get a sense of how they're feeling at the moment and if you sense some type of danger or some type of harm they you need to encourage them to contact the proper authorities their response is always well you know the police they're just gonna laugh at me or that they're gonna think I'm crazy or whatever we don't know that for every single case that's why you have to report it and Ray had a good case not too long ago, about a year and a half ago, where the witness in Texas was threatening to harm himself. And Ray did the right thing. I contacted law enforcement and I think the spouse of the subject as well. You need to do that because God forbid that that, that person actually injures himself. And there is a law enforcement investigation and they learned that we knew about these things we could be legally liable for these things believe it or not and you want a record an official record that you contacted the local law enforcement or local psychiatrist at least it's on the record the point whether or not they're gonna laugh at you or not that's that's that, that is I think it's important to follow that process and encourage the witness to, to seek professional help yeah and let's say the witness seems to us to be sane and stable and is not interested in reporting a crime, we would still take down the facts of the case? Yeah, I, I would I would totally take down the facts of the case, you know, just like the case we had up in Baltimore. Get a sketch, you know, of, of you know, if there's an entity involved. I would like to see someone sketch the interior of an alleged craft, if, if they could remember or things like that, just for our records. I think there's, you know, there's a lot of communities out there that deal with this kind of stuff. You know, they have, you know, meetings and, and they sit around and talk about their experiences. But yet, yeah, if an alleged abduction case comes to every phenomena, we will initially treat it just like any case, um, get as much information as possible, interview the witness, get a sketch if possible, and try, you know, and at least get the facts out as much as possible so we can put it in the database. Again, a reminder, if you are a witness to a UFO event, you can report it at our website, aerial-phenomenon.org. We receive hundreds of cases each year and conduct field investigations on many of those. Next up, we'd like to present part two of an interview Paul and I conducted with David Marler, author of Triangular UFOs. I'd like to go back a little bit to the Belgian wave to cover the subject of photographic evidence a little bit more broadly. Mm -hmm. uh, there was one photograph that came out, and there's been a lot of doubt cast over it lately. Uh, apparently, someone's come forward saying, I took the photograph and I faked it. Yes. I haven't looked into that myself to enough depth to know whether I believe that or not, but is there any good authenticated with a photograph with a good full chain of custody for any UFO, any triangle UFO? In my opinion, no. Uh, I'm, I'm, you know, despite having written a book on the subject, I, I consider myself very, very skeptical in my approach, and I have a pretty good threshold as far as acceptance when it comes especially to photographic and video evidence. And, uh, you know, Paul, to your point, uh, I have yet to see anything that, as you mentioned, has an established chain of custody and has been thoroughly analyzed by multiple groups. And uh, I have yet to see that. And it's sad because I think the general public, the UFO buffs, the people that are maybe have a more casual interest than, than the three of us, they, that's what they gravitate towards. It has that emotional component. People go to YouTube and they type in triangular UFO and they get that ooh and ah factor. But, you know, the U and ah factor is great if you're wanting to tell, if you're interested in telling ghost stories. I'm interested in establishing facts. And to Marsha's point, radar data, when we have radar confirmation, then that takes it into a whole different category now as far as evidence is concerned. 
And uh, but no, I, I, I have not I have yet to see anything that I would consider credible in nature. In your book, you list a very large number of cases. I can't I, I, I don't know if you ever counted them. Do you have not yet. <laughs> uh, what, what you didn't publish, though? And I don't perhaps uh, I, I don't know why, but uh, was any kind of statistical analysis of, of the kind of reports that you've collected? Yeah, and I, I've actually thought about. I've had a number of people ask me, "Are you going to write a follow-up book and so forth?" And I, I haven't even begun to entertain that that notion. But if I did, I, I think I would probably incorporate that and do, as you mentioned, a systematic overview and uh, count of reports and see what type of statistics play out. What's interesting, even though I haven't done any type of formal statistical analysis, it, it seems like there are certain years that were pivotal with regard to sightings. Uh, I mentioned in the book. One of the most groundbreaking discoveries was the fact that the there was a famous wave of sightings over Denmark in 1957, going into from November of 1957 into the spring of 1958. And the newspapers at the time were very blatant in their description. They described them as triangular spaceships. And some of the descriptions bear striking similarities to reports today and reports that we had in Belgium. And it even confirmed that the Danish Defense Intelligence Service were looking into these sighting reports. And beyond the newspapers in Denmark, I've even found uh, a Reuters news article that basically corroborated that and described these objects emitting other objects, which is a common, another common characteristic that plays out time and time again. But there are these waves of sightings. 57 was pivotal. When the Denmark wave begun, I found two cases, Wisconsin and Illinois, of triangular objects right around the same day that the Denmark wave started. And then there was a case in Indonesia that uh, I pulled from the Air Force Project Blue Book Files, an air defense intelligence report describing a triangular object that was over uh, two fishermen that were uh, there. And they described in detail this triangular object. And then I also found that there was apparently a precursor wave of sightings in England immediately before the famous wave that begun in November, on November 29th, 1989 in Belgium. So to your point, in doing a statistical analysis, it would really be interesting to see what types of patterns play out and try to see if there's any type of uh, overall pattern to these behaviors or, or these areas of activity. Well, now, this is, this is a first pattern that I've noticed from your book in, in uh, identifying companion craft often with these triangles. Now, that is something that I hadn't read about before, and you annotated uh, multiple instances of that, in addition to the fact that it appears to be anecdotally anyway that triangular craft seem to be taking over the classic saucer for, for the most noticed. Both these things were very interesting to me, the companion craft and the fact that triangular craft seem to become more prevalent. Yes, and that, that was another reason for, for writing the book was the fact that, you know, if you look at the National UFO Reporting Center statistics, and it, it, admittedly, that's primarily just reports from North America, Canada, and the United States, but there does seem to be a shift in reporting. Now, you know, and obviously we can kind of parse the data and, and dissect that a little bit, and I, I often in my lectures will state, What's being reported may not be reflective of the overall phenomenon because, admittedly, we only receive, on average, maybe one out of every 10 UFO sightings that are actually being observed. It's quite rare that those actually translate to a report that's investigated by a UFO researcher. But just taking at face value, to your point, Marsha, what is being reported, the triangular UFOs are definitely at the forefront currently. And that was another reason I felt that we really need to dive into this. It's like, why triangles? Well, they appear to be one of, if not the most reported type of shape being reported. So it, with this shift in frequency, and again, some people think that this was a new phenomenon. And I think I've clearly blown that argument out of the water when you look at the history of reports. But admittedly, there does appear to be perhaps a shift in frequency where we're seeing increased frequency of triangular UFOs, which begs the question, what are these things? Where are they coming from? Why are they here? But to your point, you know, the one in particular, there were various shapes that were reported in association with triangular UFOs. But what I found interesting was there was a case from 1984 in Maopic Falls, New York, uh, of a triangular UFO observed by a mother and a daughter outside their home and they first observed the triangular ufo and then they noticed that there was this rectangular ufo with large white lights at each corner and what was interesting about that was just five years later during the belgian wave over the town of upon a gendarme he was actually a police dispatcher there uh, by the name of albert kreutz 
observed a triangular UFO, which took off an, at an oblique angle and then was just a few seconds later replaced by a triangular UFO that came into to view. And in the book, I do a comparison of the two sketches. They're strikingly similar. But then what was really interesting was the fact we had this additional witness come forward who had not seen this information and basically stated that he had observed a triangular UFO around Scott Air Force Base on the morning of January 5th, but also simultaneously observed across the highway a rectangular UFO bearing the similar lighting characteristics. So as the investigation evolved, I continued to find these patterns that seemed to weave throughout all of these reports. Going into all the historical archive files that you've been entrusted with recently, there is a mountain of data to go through and collate. How are you going to tackle that? <laughs> I ask myself that same question. Obviously, uh, you know, as uh, uh, John Alexander, he wrote the forward of my book, you know, one of the things that he states for UFO researchers is never quit your day job or make sure you have a day job, which I do. So, I'm working 40 plus hours uh, a week and in addition trying to sift through this data. And uh, so it, it's, it's very difficult. I mean, obviously, you know, this is not a full time job for, for ufologists. So in my spare time, I'm simply, you know, systematically trying to go through more and more data. And the data I'm sifting through is, is enough to, to sort through. But then I, I'm continually trying to acquire, you know, more information, more collections from aging researchers and so forth. And um, it's interesting, too, because some of these reports, uh, there's one from Beckmeyer, Illinois, uh, not too far from Scott Air Force Base, and one from uh, Bartelso, Illinois, that I relay in the book. Um, I had actually went to the uh, Belleville News Democrat in southern Illinois years ago, back in the early 90s, to find those newspaper articles. But at the time, I wasn't even researching triangles. So I have in these articles, and sure enough, in both of those, they, they relayed these two accounts of triangular UFOs in the area. Uh, there's, to your point, there's a wealth of data out there, and the, uh, you know, I, in my humble opinion, I'm just scratching the surface as far as that goes. There's oh, so yeah. much more information out there. And what's really been interesting is it, my goal in writing the book was to get the information out there. But what I wasn't expecting was the landslide of reports and witnesses that are now coming forward contacting me stating – I've never reported this to anybody, but after reading your book, uh -huh. I felt compelled to contact you. So I'm actually receiving a lot of new information a, a, as well. And, you know, you mentioned the um, the radar data associated with the F-16 attempted identification and possible intercept of these UFOs over Belgium. One of the gentlemen that contacted me recently, which I was really surprised by, was Professor August Meeson, professor, professor Emeritus of Physics at the Belgian State University, he was the one that actually did the scientific analysis of the radar data for the Belgian military. And he had heard about my book, read it, and was writing to compliment me for my work. So that was really nice and being able to establish that connection. And more importantly, you know, then being able to, in addition, be contacted by some of these former SOBEPS investigators. So my goal is really to develop a serious international information exchange regarding these triangular UFO reports. I just like to put in a word for us. We're available to investigate, particularly mid, mid Atlantic reports. Mm -hmm. we, but we have investigators. Uh, we have one in Colorado, one in uh, New Jersey. I wanted to ask you: the Belgian wave is was now more than twenty years ago. Mm -hmm. What's the most recent wave we've seen that was of any significance? Probably the most uh, the most recent one that I can think of. And again, I, I'll be honest, the last few years I've been so focused and engrossed in historical research, I haven't been up to par on the more recent reports. I think probably the most prevalent or the one that's received the most notoriety would probably have been when they were having the Stevensville sightings down there in Texas. I think there were a number of triangular UFOs reported at the time. And then, of course, you know, the, the, and obviously there's always a smattering of, of solitary reports being reported to the National UFO, UFO Reporting Center or organizations such as yourself. But, you know, in the book, I really tried to focus more on multiple witness sightings, if at all possible, kind of in kind of in the tradition of Dr. J. Allen Hynek when he wrote his first book. You know, he was really focused on multiple witness cases because that just usually tended to be a little bit more significant as far as uh, credibility versus just taking one person's you know, account at face value. So there are a number of individual eyewitness reports, but I really tried to focus on those that involve multiple eyewitnesses. And in some cases, radar confirmation, there was a wave over in November of 1980 that uh, veteran uh, the researcher, the late Bob Pratt investigated where a, at least one or more triangular UFOs flew over Northern Missouri into uh, 
northeastern Kansas. And that was well documented both in the National Enquirer, which he had written for, as well as some of the other local newspapers in uh, Kirksville, Missouri, Trenton, Missouri, and other areas. That's the thing is that we do have a wealth of newspaper articles. And a matter of fact, um, it, at the conference in Tenley Park last week, and I opened it up with a little joke. I said, uh, you know, I was listening to uh, satellite radio the other day while I was driving across New Mexico on business. And uh, this comedian made the comment. He, he was talking about his grandfather that was dealing with senility. And he said, you know, granddad, he goes, what's it like dealing with senility? And he said his granddad looked at him and laughed. He said, well, he goes, it's not all bad. He goes, the nice thing is you can hide your own Easter eggs. I, I, I use that as, a, as a, a talking point because I think as ufologists, we hide our own Easter eggs. We go out, we investigate these reports, then we submit them to a central collection agency, and then we really don't do much with them. I mean, you know, in general, I mean, obviously yourselves, myself, and, and other researchers, we are sifting through the data. But you have to admit, the bulk of reports that we take the time, effort, and energy to go out and collect, we simply file them away in a file cabinet. And we're sitting on a lot of data, to Marsha's point, going, you know, reports going back to the late 1800s. So really, my I just decided to really take it on since I had a lot of historical material at my disposal to start going through the reports. It's like there's a lot of information here. Let me start going through this and really specifically looking for these triangular reports and, you know, the culmination of which is, you know, basically the, the, the gist of the book that I wrote. Now, you, you were a state director for MUFON for a while. Yes. The, do you still investigate reports personally? Uh, individually, uh, not so much. Uh, I just recently, in the last year and a half, moved to uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico. So I'm relatively new to the area, as well as uh, you know other interested individuals here. And for the last year, up until uh, June, July, I had really been just kind of sequestered and working on my book every weekend. And so really just in the last month or two, I've started to get out and try to establish some connections with local investigators. So Really, uh, up until now, I haven't, but uh, certainly if there was a, a good, credible case that I, I deemed worthy, and uh, I, I would certainly, you know, definitely chase after it. Fortunately, uh, being born and raised in southern Illinois, I had connections with a lot of the local law enforcement departments, whereas here I really haven't established those connections yet. But, yeah, certainly if there was a significant report, I would definitely chase after it, although – Right now, I think my focus has kind of shifted into the historical research and really looking at kind of doing more of a meta-analysis and looking at patterns in the data as a whole. Yeah, that's what I, I was going to uh, – we were talking about investigations. I kind of wanted to, since you had been an investigator, what your common approach was, what your methodology and process is when you investigate a case to, to you know, weed through what is probable – confabulation or outright hoax and what what is your approach if you could tell our audience absolutely well you know I, I think as any good investigator we need to go in with an objective mindset i'm not going out there looking to validate the ufo phenomenon uh I, i'm not interested in wasting my time chasing shadows or chasing things that aren't there i mean i genuinely genuinely want to establish definitive information and find answers to this mystery, whatever it is. I simply go in with an objective standpoint, go in, interview the witness. And really, my job is, I think, any job of any UFO investigator that takes a scientific uh, methodology is to go in and try to establish what this UFO was not. At the end of the day, if we can rule out it wasn't a weather balloon, it wasn't military aircraft, it wasn't commercial aircraft, there were no meteor activity at the time, there were no satellite reentry on that particular night. And you can systematically go through and weed out all those prosaic explanations. I've often said in lectures, the best we can do as UFO investigators, and it's in the similar vein of the Air Force, although I think we'd, we, I'd like to say we're a little bit more objective than maybe the Air Force investigations over the years, is the fact that at the end of the day, the best thing we can say is this was a genuine unknown. We can't definitively say it was an alien spacecraft. I mean, we have no evidence to support that. But if we can establish this was not military aircraft, it was not conventional aircraft, it was not atmospheric phenomenon, it was not any type of hoax, it wasn't anything of that nature, then we can, I think, establish it appears to be a genuine unknown. But I think that's the best we can really say at the end of an investigation. So I really go in trying to establish you know, what this object was or was not, and really just do that systematic process of elimination. It's interesting, after all these years, even as long as MUFON's been in existence, the best we can do is definitively say what it isn't, and we still really have no clue what it is. 
Yes, for those that think they know what it is, you know, my argument is if you if you know what it is, then provide your evidence to, to support that that thesis. And if you know what it is, then we really don't have a mystery any longer. We can all go home and we can all take on new new interests. But it is a mystery. No one has had any definitive answers to this. And it still requires, in my opinion, a serious scientific objective approach that's required on the part of investigators, which unfortunately, you know, I know the the government, the military, et cetera, sometimes gets a bad rap saying, well, they're covering all this information up and they're spreading disinformation you know, I, I think, uh, you know, as you may have read in the book, uh, I don't pull any punches. I, I take issue with the skeptics, but I also take issue with the, the, the UFO true believers. Because in either case, if you're accepting everything at face value or rejecting everything at face value, you're really not bringing anything of contribution to this field, in my opinion. It's like we have to have some modicum of filtering, so, some, some process, some methodology, as you mentioned, Marsha, in approaching this subject and trying to separate the wheat from the chaff. And as we all know, there's a lot of chaff. And so that brings us back to the beginning here, chasing the tail. The estimate of the situation. What is the estimate of the situation at this point in time? The estimate of the situation, based on on my examination, is that these objects appear to be a genuine phenomenon. You can't simply dismiss it as hallucination, mass hysteria, uh, meteorological explanations. There, there appears to be consistency in reporting worldwide over decades of something, something that it appears to be solid at times, but also, you know, appears to defy physics as we know it, you know, based on some of the unusual characteristics these things uh, demonstrate. But there does appear to be a genuine phenomenon, as I mentioned in the book, in my personal estimation, and certainly everyone's entitled to their own opinion. I don't believe this is terrestrial technology, and, and I really don't speculate as to where it comes from because, again, I can't say that definitively. I have no evidence. I state in the book these things could be dimensional, temporal, or spatial in origin. I simply don't know, but based on my opinion, based on the opinion of some of the aviation experts that I've interviewed, they simply can't wrap their minds around what these things are. And to your point, now, when that, we go that beyond to the last simple question. eyewitness reports, which is weak, in the context of, you know, eyewitness reports, to your point, we also do have those rare instances where we do have radar confirmation of something there. So I do, you may be able to dismiss eyewitness testimony out of hand, although I think I, I establish a pretty strong argument that there's a lot of eyewitness testimony. And really, at what point do you get to the point where you're forced or you have to concede that, okay, there's so many witnesses worldwide over decades reporting essentially the same thing with numerous common characteristics that we should at least it, look at this more closely, look at this subset of reports more closely. And to your point, Marsha, and that's all I was going to say, especially when we, in some cases, have radar confirmation. You are personally involved in this because of the incident with your sister and your brother-in-law. It is no longer just somebody saying something. It is somebody saying something that you know in your heart and your mind did not make up this thing. And so that must put you in an interesting situation where you know you have to stay uh, scientific, but you still have to wrap your head around the fact that this thing happened to your sister. How, does, how do you manage that? Well, and that was just one of three incidents that really kind of shaped or formulated my interest in the subject. But to your point, uh, this is this is uh, a couple, you know, my sister, my brother-in-law, who never publicly came forward with their sighting, as we were mentioning earlier, alluding to that, you know, the vast majority of reports UFO investigators never hear about. This is one of those never reported to any type of official investigating body. Uh, this was just something that they would discuss with very close friends and family members for many, many years. To this day, they don't know what they saw. You know, they state, matter of fact, it was a UFO. It was an unidentified flying object. Object right over the car. I hate to use the analogy because it's so cliche, but kind of Roy Neary from Close Encounters. Spotlight over the car and over the surrounding area. But what was interesting is there was no wind disturbance. There was no noise. So you can rule out helicopter right off the bat. I mean, there's going to be obviously a lot of wind disturbance if you have a police helicopter hovering right over you. So there, were, there was nothing like that. They looked up, they could see an array of lights affixed to something. Uh, my brother-in-law to this day says, I don't know what it was, but there was something above the car. There were lights affixed to it. There was a bright light shining down. And just as soon as the light came on, in a matter of seconds or so, the object went out. And um, I have to take my sister at face value. She's not one to, to drink, to do drugs. 
She's not fantasy prone in any way, shape or form. Quite the contrary, if you knew my sister, and I don't mean that in an unflattering way, but <laughs> she's not one to, you know, have pro, you know, fits of imagination or fantasy. Uh, she's a very pragmatic, down to earth individual. And her brother in law never even liked to talk about these types of subjects, ghosts, paranormal UFOs. If you would talk about that subject, he'd leave the room. He just did not like to talk about that stuff. So this is not the type of person that's going to fabricate a story like that because he didn't like to hear stories of that to begin with. And I appreciate your time. Thank you for talking with us. And I hope we get to talk to you again when you uh, have some of that data that you've worked with and, and we'll see where that leads us, huh? I'd like to thank David Marler, the author of Triangular UFOs, an estimate of the situation. David, any final comments you'd like to make? Uh, not really, uh, Paul, just that, uh, you know, obviously, uh, you know, you, you can look at the book or you can uh, look up my contact information online uh, by either typing the title of the book or my name. And uh, if anybody has any sighting reports they would like to share with me, uh, as, you know, to, as we were discussing earlier, I would be more than open to, to look at any additional case files or reports. I appreciate your time, David. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Take care now. Now, here's API's director and founder, Antonio Paris, with his Investigator's Notebook. Today, I will discuss one of the most common asked questions. What is the Report of Investigation, other known as the ROI? The ROI is a document meant to provide a wealth of information about a particular UFO case and also serves as the investigator's conclusion of the investigation. In order to write a successful ROI, the investigator must conduct a substantial amount of research in an effort to provide the witness as well as the UFO community enough information so he or she can make an informed choice of what transpired. The ROI also serves as a guide and standard operating procedure for the investigator by providing the steps in the investigative process. Some of these steps, which must be completed by the investigator, include witness interviews, weather and radar analysis, evidence collection, and various checks on an assortment of databases to include satellites, spacecraft launches, and local police activity. Now, Antonio, do all investigations warrant an ROI? Actually, no. Most UFO reports submitted to API do not warrant a full field investigation. Thus, the ROI is not required. A synopsis of each report, however, is provided on the case files page on our website. Some might ask why ROIs are not stored on the API website. Well, in effort to save space on the server, we don't publish all the ROIs on the API website. On occasion, however, we do publish ROIs so that the UFO community can analyze a particular or special report. Now, finally, are ROIs provided if somebody requests it? Yes. All reports, when the investigation is complete, are available upon request. We have to note, however, that witness information is not provided, and we do this for several reasons. First and foremost, it's to protect the witness, and to prevent any unwanted spillage of data that might derail a subsequent investigation that might be related to the very same case. Now let's listen to Unidentified Science with API's Deputy Director, Paul Carr. In the first installment of Unidentified Science, I said I was going to emphasize four important virtues, humility, patience, integrity, and skepticism. Of these, I think the first, humility, has been the most neglected in the UFO field. The kind of humility I am talking about here is epistemic humility, being honest with ourselves and each other about how little we reliably know and how much what we know is overwhelmed by what we don't know 
understand, or have even imagined. An example of one type of failure of humility, epistemic arrogance, let us call it, is the wide range of conjectures about non-human intelligences, and our eagerness to assign anomalous experiences to their activity. I want to emphasize that it is not a stupid question to ask whether there are other intelligences than humans in the universe, beings kind of like us in some ways, and whether we have ever been in contact with them. The arrogance comes in with connecting this naive but reasonable question with any claimed evidence or absence of evidence of alien visitation. It is arrogant to think that we should somehow know what an alien visitation would look like, how they and their technology would behave, what the purposes of their visits would be, and what sort of phenomena we would detect should they be present. Not only are we safe in saying that we simply don't know these things, but just as likely, in my view, ET intelligence, if it exists, is not only stranger than we imagine, it is stranger than we can imagine. To paraphrase the famous pronouncement known as Haldane's Law, we just have no idea what to look for, except that it's unlikely to be what we expect. I will call the notion that an ET intelligence is responsible for some UFO events the extraterrestrial conjecture, and I'd like to explain why I don't call it the extraterrestrial hypothesis. The problem with addressing this conjecture scientifically is that we have a primarily negative definition of ET. ET is not from here and is not human. ET controls some kind of technology that is not like ours. ET is the name we give to whatever is behind the data for which there is no known explanation. Also, there is a problem on the other end. The data we want to explain with the ET conjecture. We might reasonably expect that any ET presence would represent a technology far more advanced than our own. Arthur C. Clarke once wrote that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. I don't think it's straining that metaphor too much to note that magic is perplexing and misleading and by its nature not understood. So how do we form a hypothesis that we can test from the ET conjecture with solid data we have or can obtain? Unless we can reason from guess to test without a lot of ambiguity, we really don't have a proper hypothesis. Put simply, we need to be able to ask the question, what if I'm wrong? And then be able to explain clearly how the data would differ. By what tests do we distinguish alien from earthly? That is an interesting problem. An unsolved problem. There is no ET hypothesis. So current arguments for or against it are moot. If you take nothing else away from this segment, please remember this. The ET hypothesis that is so much maligned by some and so fervently embraced by others is a straw man. It doesn't exist as such. Does that mean we just give up? After all, aren't most of us studying UFOs because we feel in our gut that there may be an ET signal in all the noise? How can we ever know the truth? I don't think we do give up. But we have to be willing to be completely wrong about our putative alien visitors, trusting the process that leads not to final answers, but to better and better questions. I can't promise we'll know the truth, but we will gradually eliminate more and more false notions. We must start with informed questions we can ask and answer by application of the scientific method. We could start, for example, with asking questions about human witnesses and the patterns of reports. Here are some questions that can be asked scientifically. What factors help to motivate someone to report an apparently anomalous event versus not doing so? How do the people who report UFOs differ from those who don't? Are professional people reluctant to report UFOs because of possible career repercussions? 
There are many more such questions. And if we can figure out how to collect the data, we can gain insight into what the UFO data primarily consists of, reports based on human memory. At present, we don't know how to separate patterns in the reporting of the phenomena from patterns in the phenomena themselves. Since UFO studies are our best to proto-science with no established paradigm, our best friend is mainstream science, equipped with hard-won paradigms, meaningful instruments, and even some funding. The more we learn about the universe and exoplanets, about the evolution of life and mind, and the possibilities of the human future, the more we can refine our ideas about E.T., we can't see it clearly now, but there may be some real ET hypotheses further down the road. This process has already begun. In the meantime, we need to keep up high-quality field investigations and careful sifting through the data, separating the real from the misperceived or simply imagined. We need to share data so we can look for patterns, and perhaps we'll find them. I think it's worth a shot. Please contact API if you want to participate in that enterprise. In the next Unidentified Science, I will talk about a major problem in UFO studies, our reliance on eyewitness testimony, and why we have to push hard in the direction of the tiny fraction of cases with physical evidence and multiple witnesses. Well, it's at that point now in our episode when listeners get to ask their questions and comment on the podcast, APIs, investigations, and methods, and UFOs in general. You can ask your questions on Twitter or Facebook or via email or our Google Plus listener community. And now here's Cherish, APIs Media Relations Director. Hi, this is Cherish Paris with this episode's question from our followers. Scott Ward on Twitter wants to know what your thoughts are on the prediction that Seth Shostak of SETI made. He is predicting that we may find intelligent life by 2040. What are your thoughts? Would you agree with this prediction? Thanks, Scott. Antonio, you're actually about to publish a new book on space science. Based off of your interviews and research, how would you respond to this 2040 prediction by Seth Shostak? Thanks, Scott. That's a great question. Although I'm very hopeful that we will find a signal from outer space, I am very skeptical as well. Mainly for two reasons. First, the distances between us and any other planets out there are rather large. So even if a signal was transmitted to us, by the time it gets here, due to the inverse square law, the signal would have been degraded to a point where it's indistinguishable from background noise. And second, even if we did find something, how will we interpret it? How will we decipher it? How will we understand the language? And how will we know that it really is from another intelligent life? Again, great question. And now our 20 second recommendations. Let's start with Cherish. This is Cherish Paris with a book recommendation. Prior to attending Apicon 2014 in Tampa, Florida on from May 16th to May 17th, we definitely recommend that you check out John Alexander's book, UFOs. He will also be speaking at the conference. Check it out at www.aerial-phenomena.org. This is Antonio with my 20 second recommendation. I highly recommend that you go to our website at www.aerial-phenomena.org and go to our UFO Research Center where you will find a wealth of information including how to conduct lens flare analysis. That's again www.aerial-phenomena.org. Okay, my recommendation is to Google German rocketry pioneer Hermann Obert. He was a genius and he was a staunch believer that flying saucers are, in his words, real, and that they are spaceships from another solar system. There is no doubt in my mind that these objects are interplanetary craft of some sort. That quote from Hermann Obert, O-B-E-R-T-H. Google him.
For me this time, it's the paperback edition of Forbidden Science by Jacques Vallée. This is Vallée's journal from his years as a young astronomer and UFO researcher in the 1960s. It gives us a close and personal look at some of the key people and events of those days. It is a real eye-opener on the realities of trying to do science outside the mainstream. And finally, Antonio, how about an update on APICon 2014 plans? Hi, everyone. APICon Tampa is going to be the largest UFO-related conference the state of Florida has seen in decades. From May 16th to the 17th, Aerial Phenomena will host APICon at the Clarion Hotel and Conference Center near Busch Gardens, Tampa. We have many great speakers, authors, as well as celebrities. For more information and tickets, visit aerial-phenomenon.org. Well, it looks like that puts the wrap on API Case Files, episode number two. Thanks a lot for joining us. For more information or to report a UFO, go to aerialphenomenon.org. And remember, Aerial Phenomena Investigations is not a UFO club. We're a network of serious investigators. And if you're interested in becoming an investigator with API, please contact us. Let us know more about you. This reminder, all links in the show notes are at apicasefiles.libsyn.com. And special thanks to our guest, David Marler. To Ray Nuvalone. And the API team. The next episode of API Case Files should be out this April or May. More cases, more interviews with key researchers, and hopefully some appearances by you, the listener. Until next time, I'm Marcia Barnhart, Chief of API Investigations, and your host. This has been API Case Files Episode 2. This podcast is a production of Aerial Phenomena Investigations. Episode 2 was produced by Paul Carr, with help from Antonio Paris, Cherish Paris, Nancy Doughty, and Marcia Barnhart. Music on API Case Files Episode 2 is by All India Radio, DJ Spooky, Cat Box Games, Paper Navy, Nobara Hayakawa, and Totality Music. All music is licensed under Creative Commons. The spoken content of API Case Files is distributed under the Creative Commons Attribution Sharealike 4.0 license. <laughs> <laughs>